Thank you very much for both of uh, your contributions. I will confine myself to two questions so that we can quickly open the discussion uh, to the audience. The first one actually concerns the power question and perhaps privacy data protection. You both emphasized very much uh, the gains in efficiency. And at the same time, you um, seem uh, actually said that everybody becomes more powerful. There is no shift, we just, uh, it's not a cake that we redivide. we all gain power. Are you really sure about this? Is there no loser in this process? Well, I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, no, see, again, I'm speaking from a stone experience. It's very hard for me to, uh, to see who has been losing from all of this, power-wise or otherwise. Uh, especially as, I mean, um, something to understand, for example, when it comes to privacy, for example. Um, Estonian people, why they love this solution so much is two things. First of all, they do really bring you value. And if something brings you value, you do take a serious look at, let's say, the cost and the benefit calculation. And as long as, sort of, let's say, the safeguards are there, like I talked about the legal protections that I always own my data, I can control it technologically, then again, people are happy to move forward with that. So that's why I mean that exactly in our end, at least, it seems to us that we figure out a way to make everybody win in the end. Let me rephrase my question. Um, according to your observations, do you think that people value privacy less for the sake of gains in efficiency? Is it that they have less problems with giving away their data, say, to the tax office or um, to other public authorities because they save time and don't have to care? Is that what you see when you talk to customers? Uh, I think I see it every day. If you go to social media, you give all your, or a lot of private data um, for a little value. And so it's the same game with publics, but in publics you have regulations. In Germany you have a strong regulation, what can be done and what not. If you send your private ideas, messages, videos and so on, maybe to Facebook, you have no control. I think that's the difference. The difference to how it used to be before we started digitizing interactions? Yeah, yeah, yeah this is, um, uh, if you compare five minutes for text, I need five days. Uh, that's one value, and they have all my data, and I have to, to declare it, and this is one example. And I hope that we have losers at the bad boys uh, to, to yeah, prevent crime and all these things, and tax fraud and so on. And I hope that there will be these users. And if you go to the medical areas, um, at the moment, the medical area is focused on the past, because we have Krankenkassen, and they all have a lot of data, and they do nothing. With all the data? With all this data. And now we need, of need activities to use this data um, to, to make a forward and uh, to, to show you what's going on if you live in this, this you kind mean of a... Yeah. Predictive analytics? Yeah, this is, is predictive analytics maybe for healthcare. Mm -hmm. What do you say about that? you see people valuing privacy less than they used to? Well, I can't comment for Germany, right? No. <laughs> but in <laughs> Estonia, at least, it's, it's never been an issue, really. I mean, uh, first of all, all, whenever we started really with the digital government and services that I was explaining about, actually the sort of right safeguards in terms of legal and, and frameworks were placed immediately as well, right? So it was not like we were innovating something sort of in a gray area and then some, some regulation came. We immediately saw that we have to make sure that the trust is there so the trust environment, but you know, to go move forward, then we also provide the value, right? And I think there's one more thing I want to say on the note is that uh, you mentioned sort of social media, for example. I mean, I don't want to demonize social media, but I think there's a lot of um, understanding in Estonia is that definitely, I mean, who else is that to trust in the government? In government, at least I have some control about, let's say, how the regulation goes, even if it might be very indirect. I may not always be happy with the outcome, but basically this is still sort of a clear, clear process. Whereas with uh, private sort of uh, companies, the only option is that I can use a service or not. That's my only sort of option, basically. Mm -hmm. But if you, as, a, as you told us, uh, your citizens can sort of block access to data, but surely this is not true for, say, tax information. 
or is it? Fair enough. But this is exactly where regulation comes into the game. All these sort of uh, cases where you cannot do that, basically these are defined by the law. So mm -hmm. law becomes the basis of first of all need to mm -hmm. know what kind of data mm -hmm. who can have access to. And secondly, also the question, are there any limitations, for example, to me deleting data or not mm -hmm. allowing access and so forth. So basically this is, um, if it's considered a public good, it's, been, it's limited, yes. But if not, if it's just personal stuff like health would be, you have much more way of control. Mm -hmm. There's one other related question in that, uh, to that area. Since you are considered the pioneer in e-government, uh, certainly in Europe, is there any sense of vulnerability um, in your country if you digitize so much and interconnect so many databases? Are you not afraid of people attacking those systems? Because it's sort of, you see this in almost every country, um, that databases are getting hijacked. Well, we have had that, and um, I mean, it's no secret that in 2007, for example, Estonia became the, uh, the first country in the world to be cyber attacked on a large scale. I mean, these were very simple attacks. It was just brute force trying to take the websites down, uh, disrupt the service, but still. But no, the understanding is that, well, first of all, um, it's with all the risks, uh, it's the same thing. It's a cost-benefit thing. So if we figure out a way to mitigate, to manage the risks, and we get enough value out of that, then basically, again, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a choice to go forward, especially as we see with cyber risks, a lot of them can be uh, managed to, uh, not away, but to an uh, sort of acceptable level. That's why we work a lot, a lot on cyber security, like putting in place, you know, uh, secure authentication for everybody in Estonia. We work a lot on sort of reactive sites, so if something happens, we're able to react very fast. Uh, we work a lot with international partners, including Germany, for example, on the NATO frameworks and others, so that everybody will be more secure. So basically, long story short, we have to invest a lot, and we do invest a lot into cybersecurity because the vulnerability theoretically is there, but we invest a lot in order to enable us to be digital, and we see that it, it does, does allow that. Would you confirm that it's a risk-benefit uh, issue? So you have to accept some risks in order to reap the benefits? Yeah, I confirm. It's an ongoing game, and uh, in the past, maybe 2007, it was easy, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, now we learn, have new ideas how to protect the data. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a public-private agreement on how to look at these risks and deal with the vulnerabilities that emerge. Out of, yeah? Well, fair enough, and, and, and the, I can say from our side that we are always very public if something happens or should happen, right? Mm -hmm. Because with that we see transparency, we see actually also as a measure to ensure this trust. And, um, you know, we never say that, you know, it will never happen. Rather we say it will happen sooner or later. But mm -hmm. the point is that exactly, I mean, we just do our best to avoid it. And if it happens, to react really good and fast and sort of secure enough. Yeah, but that is like the toothpaste out of the tube, right? You won't get the data back in once somebody got them. Fair enough, fair enough. But I think there's another point to that, saying that in Estonian sense at least, uh, when it comes to services, we don't really um, concern ourselves that much with confidentiality in a way. Uh -huh. What we really mostly protect is integrity, which means that you know, data would not get changed or tempered, right? Uh -huh. So, and, and that comes a lot from thinking that, uh, for example, my health record. If my health record goes public, I might have a bit of inconvenience. But if somebody changes my blood type, no, that's bad. So uh, that's why we, that's again a risk approach. We just consider the risk of integrity the highest one. Of course, yes, we do our best for confidentiality as well. But at the end of the day, some things can be let go if needed, but it doesn't go as far. It doesn't go as far, it's a theoretical cases only. This is certainly an interesting perspective. I wonder whether the audience uh, agrees with that, that the confidentiality might not be that much of a problem. But before I open to the public, there's a second uh, question I'd like to address, and that concerns the future. Both of you talked about what you're doing right now and gave a bit of an idea of what might be coming. But what do you think we will get to see in, say, 10 years of time? Where do you both see you, your company, and what kind of services you offer, and you, your government? What do you think you will be doing uh, in 10 years' time? Yeah, uh, hopefully successful. You never know in this uh, fast-moving area. If you look back 10 years ago in the computer industry, a lot of good names, now they are gone. Um, I hope that Cisco is on the right way. 
um, we will move from products to services, mm -hmm. web-based or cloud-based services, which that means, um, has every, anybody used WebEx? Yeah, so it's a Cisco cloud-based service. Yeah, that means so we have IT infrastructure in the background, and the new idea, we have a partnership with Apple, and makes it really easy, which means push, press one, only one button on your iPhone, and then you can more make a video call with somebody else, and you need a lot of technology in the background that it works. And in terms of bigger sort of visions of infrastructure, the Internet of Things is coming. Where do you see your company in that field? Or what will be the field uh, after? We, we will focus on the IoT, which means Internet of Things, Internet of Everything area, uh, with devices in, in Cine Things, maybe washing machine and so on, and uh, that they work together. Okay. I think you? the I think the sad news to some people is that the government probably has not gone away yet. So big data will not be president probably yet, but uh, ten years time. But at least, well, I mean, if I say from Estonia's side, um, we are very much working to make sort of these um, directions that I mentioned uh, happen. So I, I, I truly believe that in ten years time we can be out of the way, truly invisible, uh, by use of data in all those transactions that doesn't actually have to take place. And really, sort of, you know, made made radical changes to to people's efficiency in life. You mean government policy making turn it into an algorithm? Well, n not policy making services at least, and this is exactly where we don't have to be in there. Policy making and let's say uh, information provision, defense, all these areas, these still remain very important. But but at least from the services, I see no point why we need to be sort of the obstacle on the way. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Now I'd like to ask the audience, are there any questions you would like to, to raise? Yes, please. Please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm uh, Hani. I'm working at the Innovation Center of SAP in Potsdam. And um, OK, three things. One thing, I would like to thank you for this presentation and to show that actually a social state is possible within uh, digital spheres. Um, now, three things are coming. So one thing to add to the security discussion is there's always a hybrid system possible. That means like you can have a cloud, but you can also have an on-premise system. So you always have a backup. When someone hacks your system and you know that, you can always kind of have the backup of the data you retrieved um, during a certain time. So you can always uh, like look up if the, if the data was exchanged or something like that. Um, Two questions to you, to the Estonian system. So one thing you maybe like recognized also, the questions mainly coming from Germany is also always security based. And you said like that the mindset of the people were very open when you started to kind of digit digitize your um, government. How did you do that? Like how did you do this shift from, did they vote for it or did you like just, you know, set a law? Oh, yeah, the second question is, um, do you have this IT department within the government, or are you working with a company or freelancers? So the first question, thank you, first of all. And, and I think you're quite right with the backups, and, and this is what I mean by this kind of ability to react fast. I mean, sort of, let's say, having ability to boot up from a sort of other location, whatever sort of backup means, oh, this is part of the plan, right? How to, how to have the contingency uh, plan in place to, if worse comes to worst, theoretical risks realize how to really then act on them. But your questions, um, no, we never voted, <laughs> directly, that is. Because I still say that uh, all the sort of you know liberties, if you wish, and sort of you know basis for uh, digital services are laid by the law, by the regular procedures of parliamentary voting, which is very public and transparent. In Estonian case, you can follow and participate in that online and so forth. But yeah, we never had a referendum of sorts, so you know just public vote like that in a way. But the second question, um, we do have uh, quite a bit of technical staff uh, in house, but there's some uh, to, to a certain degree. For example, we don't code in-house. So we always work with outside vendors, um, Estonian or foreign, to basically exactly you know, really develop the systems that are underlying all of our digital government. But the architecture, the project management, so this kind of business knowledge, that's on the government side, always, yeah. Thanks. Yes. 
Thank you. Um, Sergei Zyoshenko, Free Rush Civil Society Forum. Um, actually, I'm, I adore this Estonian system, e-residency e and also e-government, so and actually I was also offered to apply for an e-residency of Estonia, so just but I haven't applied yet, so my concern is um, it uh, works quite well in democratic societies, I suppose, so these digital, these digital things. So what, uh, how, how is, is it to secure that it, uh, this data wouldn't be abused in non-democratic societies? For example, so I know that uh, uh, a similar system was, uh, was developed for the Azerbaijani government, and uh, let's put it uh, politically correct, so Azerbaijan has some problems with the human rights and so on. So just like, uh, like how to be secure that this data wouldn't be abused by another government, still doing good job, doing good business, so, but not uh, to uh, somehow jeopardize people uh, in other countries. Thank you. It's always a big fear, like uh, it's the beginning of fire. Now they find out the first mankind, oh, we have fire and it's dangerous and let's stop it. And so it's the same discussion. It can be dangerous and you are right. And uh, maybe that you know that you are in an area, not this area, but outside, uh, which was also a government with a few problems, which was not so good. And... Um, yeah, but uh, you should focus what's possible and be an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> well, but to me, and, and let's say to we've been asked this question a lot, so it's not a new question at all, right? And to me, it, you're quite right. It's it's built on a premise of democracy. It's built on the premise of trust in the government, right? So my answer to you is that so basically, if this scenario happens, that for example, Estonia would would not be a democracy at all anymore. Well, I think first of all, we have the bigger problems at, at hand. And secondly, is that so, but what are the odds of that? So basically, it's again, so let's say, the calculation of, of the risk and the benefit that you have to do. Basically, we don't stop lighting the candles on the Christmas tree because the, the tree might catch fire. And that's a bigger road than, a, for example. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in Estonia, you don't. <laughs> So, uh, so, and so I would say that, you know, odds of that happening are much more bigger than for that, you know, the, the, to learn away from democracy. But I think the second half of your question is that uh, you're quite right that technology can be used good and bad ways. Unfortunately, it's up for the particular sort of population or, or, or the nation to then sort of figure out you know, what are they happy with. I cannot speak for the Azerbaijani people. I wouldn't be probably happy there myself. In Estonia, luckily, it's not the case, right? Through transparency, through just ensuring that, you know, the, the rule of law is kept, that's how we are able to ensure that exactly we, you can trust us with your data. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm Ingolf Pernis from the Humboldt Institute as well. Um, you didn't talk about uh, democracy and voting. And I had heard that uh, Estonia is very often mentioned as one example where e-voting has been practiced and in part practiced successfully. Could you give us a little bit more of information how this runs and how what are, what are the problems if there is any and how you see the future of e-voting in Estonia? Thank you for the question. Uh, I didn't talk about many things. <laughs> so, but basically, the fact that I didn't talk about this is so voting is uh, in that sense a very simple procedure. There's not much data involved in that in Estonia, given the topic of today. But I'll, I'll answer you. I will answer you. So basically, we've been using. Um, internet voting for uh, eight elections now, since 2005. Um, so basically, whenever, whenever you vote for local municipality, national parliament or European parliament, there's an option to do that online. Wherever you are in the world, um, we had, last spring, we had um, national sort of parliament elections. So we had about one third of the votes come in online, two thirds on paper, regular ballot voting. 
And these were from 116 countries around the world, including Germany, of course. So basically, why we do internet voting is to offer another channel that's very convenient for people to use wherever they are in the world or whatever they try to do or want to do. Paper option is there. Many, most people still use it, as, as you heard. But at least, yeah, a critical mass have went for digital one because it's just so much more convenient. Literally, voting, um, well, if you know whom to vote for, <laughs> is uh, two or three minutes of, uh, of, of an undertaking, whereas me going out to the ballot station, you know, on a Sunday, do I want to do that? But I want to still vote. I want to be part of the democracy. So I have a very convenient option for that. Can I add a question to that? Uh, how do you solve this uh, tension between authentication and anonymity of voting? Well, very easily. So first of all, yes, you have to authenticate yourself and sort of, you know, authorize the vote uh, when you go in. But basically, just like in a sort of voting booth, uh, you know, before the vote gets counted, uh, you basically take the sort of the identification part away. So only the votes, you know, and sort of the candidate numbers are basically what you do count. Mm -hmm. So you separate sort of between, you know, the, the, the voting file or the data bit in a way. Uh, but that means you cannot recount if anybody doubts the outcome of the election, or can you? You cannot, well, you cannot recount whom did you vote for, but you can recount the set of the votes still, because exactly, the, the, first of all, you will know how many people were voting and how many votes there have to be, right? So you can match at least in, in, even as simple as that, for example. So it's the, it's the number, it's the set of the uh, anonymous votes that matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, Larissa, there was somebody behind. Uh -huh. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Srinivas. I'm a chief data scientist of a um, smart city startup in Berlin and a visiting researcher from the University in Sussex. I have uh, two questions. One is, actually, you made the process of getting an e citizenship quite easy. I got it uh, quite recently, and it was pretty painless, except I still need to visit Estonia to set up a bank account. So I'd love to visit Estonia, but not just for the purpose of setting a bank account. So when is that going to be removed? And the second is a bit more futuristic. With all this data you're getting, and as a lead on to the question about e-voting, wouldn't it be possible, uh, in the strictest machine learning and AI sense, to predict which politicians are best for the country? <laughs> then you don't need voting at all. I mean, Ooh, that, very good that would be much easier. So. <laughs> Trust me, there are days when I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll start for the first one. <laughs> So yes, with e-residency, you're quite right. And so uh, the thing is that so we always have said that uh, we do the e-residency as a startup. So even as a government, we try to work as a startup. We went live when you know uh, not everything has to be ready. We're building these services with the users. So the good news to you is that the bank account uh, digital opening should be there in just a few months, basically. So the law is already in the sort of pipeline for that. Uh, but the other part, well, <laughs> I'm happy to let you comment. Would you want to have uh, AI suggesting you what's the best prime minister? <laughs> uh, no answer. <laughs> I think it still depends on your political preference. <laughs> uh, my name's Arndt Leining. I'm a PhD student at the Hertie School of Governance here in Berlin. And I love what you just said. I mean, I'd love to do my, my, on, my taxes online like you outlined. In Germany, they have to snail mail me a passport before I can do it. Um, but when I think about my grandparents, they don't own a computer, they don't own a smartphone, they don't even own a mobile phone, right? And so my question is, what do you do about people who don't own a computer or a smartphone in your country? Do you develop services for them as well, or do you just wait for them to die out? <laughs> Which will happen. <laughs> We don't do that. We don't do that. We are a benevolent government. Um, so, first of all, well, they have always had a service option anyway. So that still lingers on. I mean, they've had the paper option, the analog, if you wish, uh, ever since you know we started as restarted as a country. So we haven't taken that away. Uh, you can still vote on paper. You can still do your taxes, uh, you know, on paper as well. Four percent of people do. So 96 percent is online. Four percent still show up, you know, in a, in a tax office. Um, the other thing, the other part of that is that um, our luck has been that, you know, we've had a very fast increase of digital literacy, right? So at this point, we have 90% of uh, uh, adults, including elderly, actually online. Of course, in the oldest age groups, it's, it's a bit less than that, 60, 70%, but it's still 
it has increased very fast. And first of all, we put money in that, into training and sort of awareness raising for that with the public, private and public sector together. But secondly, technology has helped a lot down that line. Um, iPads, or three, let's say tablets, not that use a particular platform, tablets. They're so much more convenient and intuitive, for example, to use, right, than the, the old PC used to be. So again, these things, these sort of technological advances also help out. We are now studying also, for example, with language technology, because we make sort of uh, voice recognition and synthesis in interfaces so that you don't have to, you know, knew, know how to manip manipulate the device at all, but just by talking, you could actually sort of, you know, try out the service, for example. And, but down the line, we are very heavily thinking, uh, could we also make um, services mandatorily online? Because the 4% of, for example, the tax office, 4% of people who go there uh, per transaction, it's very uh, costly. It's very, very costly. So for access reasons, we still keep it, but we are thinking, but could there be an alternative? So for example, could we offer this way that you can sort of mandate somebody to, to uh, conduct a service for you? Or if you make them automated, is there a need for service anyway? Or for example, you can uh, somehow have uh, your social worker take care of your stuff or whatever like that. And we are not the first one. I mean, Denmark uh, issued uh, basically law saying that services are mandatorily online. There's lots of exceptions <laughs> where you can get out of that. You can still show up and do something on paper. But the point is that you know it's been done, tried, and we're happy to sort of you know be the next one in that sense. Because yes, our saturation rate is so high already that that keeping the paper analog is getting costly and costly. Hi, uh, my name is Victoria Dykes. I'm a master's student at the Heritage School of Governance. Uh, and so as an American living in Germany, I am constantly astounded by the governmental inefficiencies that uh, mark everyday life in this country. You say and this coming out of America? Yes, you know, and I say that coming from America, um, which will tell you something. Um, and so when it comes to Estonia, I've talked about this topic with people before and how uh, what a compelling model they provide, but then the response is always, well, you can't compare Estonia and Germany. Uh, the country size is so different, the history is different, and evidently the mindset of the people is significantly different, uh, as evidenced by when you were saying that Estonians are more likely to value integrity over confidentiality, which I don't think you could say for many Germans. Uh, and so my question is sort of, do you think that there are any sort of general best practices or lessons learned that could be extrapolated from the experience in Estonia and more readily applied to other countries like Germany? Thank you. Thank you for the question. <laughs> I'd be happy to hear your views on that too, but, but I mean, I hope so. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, I mean, I, mean I, I, I do think that, first of all, yes, I mean, it doesn't have to be just Estonian experience. There's lots of good digital practices to go around. We have stuff to learn from, from others as well, including, you know, some, you know, Bocas of Excellence in Germany, for example. So, this is a two-way game always, and, and uh, that's a general answer I'm giving you. I don't see a reason why at least the principles, you know, could not be sort of discussed, debated, or considered, and, and perhaps even applied, whatever the size. And I'll tell you one more thing about the size. Uh, we work a lot with the British government. Um, I don't hear any boos. Okay, good. <laughs> so um, we work a lot with the British government, and what we clearly found out there was that uh, basically the difference between our governments, besides you know royalty and stuff, <laughs> is uh, is the number of lines in the database. In terms of functions we provide, in terms of services that we are running, we are very much similar. So basically, in that sense, even more sort of knowledge knowledge can be applied. Yeah, and, and I, I agree, in Germany we have room for improvement. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Um, um, I think as a default... Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Wolfgang Schulz from World Institute for Internet and Society as well and Bredo Institute in Hamburg. Um, um, as it is so often the case, uh, you start talking about technology and then you recognize you're talking about uh, on cultural issues at the end. And when I uh, imagine a German administration official, my first uh, association is not he wants to make my life easier, but uh, uh, maybe other things. And um, uh, basically, um, it's an issue, as I said, uh, on trust. And uh, what I would be interested in is um, your perception, what about other countries and their mindsets? Are there some allies there in Europe? Or uh, is Germany um, the country where um, uh, it's most difficult to implement these kind of ideas as far as you can judge? Uh, and uh, was it in Estonia the way that the mindset was this way from the beginning? Or was it a process where you could see, okay, that helps me, and so that's uh, um, something um, uh, which is good and 
with that at the end change the attitude of uh, administrators as well. Thanks. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'll, first of all, I'll, this is a warning. I will choke now. <laughs> but <laughs> but the point is that so uh, you, you mentioned sort of the mindset of the, of the civil servants, right? Well, in Estonia, I think the small size helps because when I go home, you know, the same sort of people I'm trying to do service with, they're not my neighbors. <laughs> they know me. So if I'm doing a bad job and not making life easier, well, they will not like me. Mm. And I like to be liked. <laughs> But on a serious note, well, I think I think there's a truth to that. Uh, I'm not a cultural expert, to be honest with you. First of all, and I think it's in in that sense very hard to generalize, right? But I mean, we do see every now and then that, uh, of course, there are some countries, you know, with whom we sort of more easily find a sort of common language and sort of you know with whom we sort of try to, for example, initiate first pilot projects with and so forth. Um, I'm looking at the ambassador now, how, how political I can be, but uh, <laughs> but I think I think very honestly, I think there are like three cultures, three digital cultures in Europe. One is the Nordic one, where we clearly belong to, right? Then it's like the sort of, you know, uh, if you wish, like the continental Europe one, right? And then there's the Mediterranean, like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I'm generalizing a lot here, but this is sort it of... It was an how invitation to stereotypes, to be fair. <laughs> But then there are exceptions. Portugal, very Mediterranean, but very good digitally. So you never know. Our last question. Um, Nicholas Talatskovic from the Technical University of Berlin. Hi. Um, I just have a question regarding policies in place to sort of prevent um, abuse of data by companies. So say you're a healthcare company and you want to offer, you, you offer premium reductions for people that basically share your share their data with you um, which sounds good at first but then basically forces poorer people to have to share their data with other companies simply to um, well simply to be able to have enough money at the end of the month are there rules in place in Estonia to sort of prevent this kind of nudging of data abuse or uh, first you need a whole evening to discuss it because you have the same with connected cars and so on. And uh, if you reduce it to Estonia, it's easier. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll reduce it to Estonia and to the health example you brought, because I think the fields are very different in terms of, let's say, how sensitive is the data and sort of why do we see the public good behind, right? Uh, but when it comes to health, currently the situation is very easy. It's not a case at all because we don't actually currently let uh, third parties really provide a service and the whole sort of the coverage is universal and publicly funded for. So basically, in that sense, only medical professionals have the access and sort of, you know, service provision anyway. And there's nothing that sort of people necessarily pay out of the pocket, right? Unless it's, you know, small, I don't know, visit fee or whatever. So it doesn't apply yet, but actually you're asking something that's very close to our sort of next steps. Because uh, now we're trying to sort of also redesign our health system, our digital health system, around sort of allowing third parties to come in. And we're exactly starting to debate these sort of same sort of rules. Okay, how far do we go? How, what kind of sort of practices, business practices to allow? So I don't have a good answer to you yet, but I'm sure, you know, uh, next time we meet, I, I hope to. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Sim Siku, Dirk um, Mankov, for these insightful presentations and the very good discussion afterwards. So please. Thank you. <laughs>